Hi, I'm Arlington Jones, and this is The Way I Hear It. Today, my special guest is the legendary arranger, composer, producer, Johnny Pate. I'm gonna clap for you myself. Well, I'm so excited to have him here today at the Steinway Hall in Dallas. So we're just gonna get right to it. We're gonna play a little bit, give you a little medley, and then we'll um, sit and talk with Johnny.
Well, I really enjoy getting a chance to play with you, Johnny. I appreciate that. Thank well, you. Well, I hope I didn't embarrass you too badly. Oh, not at all. Because <laughs> like I say, uh, I constantly say I'm not a piano player. I just like to play the piano. Oh, you sound but great. I'm not a piano player. You sound great, and your tone is so beautiful. Your songs oh. are so beautiful. So I, it Thank was a you. pleasure getting Thank a chance you. to play, play well, with you. Well, I'm really excited about the interview. I will say now that it's your resume is so extensive, we don't have time to get through everything. But we're going to try to hit as much as we can. And um, really, if you allow me, pick your brain some. I know you got some great stories for us and really give us some insight. So I'm excited about that. So I want to say again, this is Johnny Pate. I put the legendary on there because it's really legendary, arranger, composer, producer, even bassist, but I'm really happy to have you here today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. yeah. Well, great. Well, what I want to do is even just kind of highlighting some things. We're just going to, I'm just going to start saying some things that I have written. If anything's incorrect, you can correct me, and then we'll get into the questions. But uh, you were born in Chicago Heights in 1923. Right. Yes, that's wonderful. And you played in the Army Band, um, listening to the Army during World War II. And you started um, writing arrangements, is that correct? Right. Okay. Now just tell me how you, one, started playing bass, and how did you get into really writing arrangements? Uh, well, uh, I'll even go back a little further for you. Okay. Uh, in 1942, I finished high school in the spring of 42, early summer. By that September, I was classified in the first World War II draft I was classified in 1A. That okay. meant we were the first to go. So by January, by January, I was in the Army. Mm. And so therefore, I never had a chance to go to college or do anything else that young people do between high school and college. Okay. And going into the Army, um, before then, the musical training that I'd had, I'd. I'd had some childhood piano, and uh, I was playing most everything by ear. Uh, in the sixth or seventh grade, a band master who sort of had a lock on just about everything around Chicago Heights, uh, he had thrown a tuba in my hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I played tuba for just a few years. Okay. But then I'd rather get into sports, I got into high school sports. I played basketball in high school. So the music kind of took a back seat, but I still had that love for music. Okay. So going into the Army, I was drafted into a, an infantry, infantry company. We were sent to Camp Wheeler, Georgia, just outside of Macon, mm -hmm. for our infantry training. And we were supposed to be there for 13 weeks of training before they shipped us to Europe to the war. Okay. At this particular camp, they had a uh, band that was stationed there, and that all they did was just play music. And luckily, the band's table of organization called for two tuba players, but they only had one. So when I found out that if I picked up the tuba again, this might keep me from having to tote a rifle around and maybe get shot at. <laughs> so all of a sudden, that tuba looked very, very good to me. Okay. So uh, I luckily got into the band, picked up the tuba, and within the band's structure, they had two dance orchestras, but they only had one guy in the whole organization that played upright bass fiddle. But uh, being Army, you know, and they had all the instruments and everything right there, and they had another bass there. So I said, well, let me have that bass and give me a book. Okay. So I took the bass and a book, and I taught myself to play upright bass. At the same time, they had a couple of guys in the band who were arrangers. I saw them writing. Here I am, a little 19-year-old kid, and I'm peeking over their shoulders. And I said, hmm, I said, I can do that. And I didn't realize what all was involved. I didn't realize where you had to figure out the timing, the correct timing, and 
uh, I knew what the notes were, but uh, then I f found out that I had to figure out the trans uh, how to the transpose ins yeah. instruments. How yeah. tenor saxophone was a B flat instrument, the alto saxophone was an E flat instrument, right. and I had to go through all that and learn all that, which uh, I eventually taught myself how to do all that. And wow. So I taught myself to arrange as well as play bass. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. So then, once you finished the, finished uh, uh, in the service, um, you went on to play with quite a few people um, after that. Yeah, well I decided while I was in service that uh, I wanted to try to make a career of music, you know, okay. in music. And, okay. uh, so when I got out, uh, by the time I got out, I, um, at that time, and I think they probably still have it, I think all the GI Bill, and under the GI Bill, you could go to school, you could go to college. So I immediately enrolled in the conservatory. Okay, I was gonna ask about yeah, that. Yeah, okay. I enrolled in conservatory, because I wanted to really brush up on what I had taught myself and be sure to do it the right way. Okay. But at the same time, I, when I came out of service, I had a son mm -hmm. who happened to be standing over here right now. <laughs> and um, I hadn't been out too long before I had a daughter who was standing over here also. And so when I got into conservatory, I was still trying to be this musician, make a living being a musician. So. Every time a gig would come up, whether it was in town or out of town, I had to take that gig because I got a little family to support here. Yeah. And um, so I never was able to really get a degree, but I'd jump into to school every time I'd get a chance. But every time I'd get into school, something would come up and I'd get a gig out of town and I'd have to take that gig. So I never, I never did get a degree in music. Okay, okay. But you were playing bass, I if was I was correct, bass, with, right. in 1946 with uh, Coleridge Davis's big band? Yeah. Uh, I was discharged from the Army in the spring of 1946. Okay. And um, when I was discharged, uh, I ended up back home in Chicago because my wife and my son were there. Okay. Uh, my son was born in, in Georgia. Mm-hmm. Alabama or Georgia, but I think it was, huh? It was Georgia, okay. okay. He was born in Georgia. I, I knew uh, my first wife and I, we got married in Alabama. And, uh, so he was born in Georgia, but they had come up to Chicago to live with my mother, actually okay. Chicago Heights. Right, right. And uh, they were with my mother. But when I got discharged, I headed straight for New York. Okay. Because. At that time, young and eager, and I knew New York was where jazz was happening, and I, yeah. and I had an aunt and uncle who lived in Queens, and uh, they didn't have any children, so I went and I lived with them for a while. And while there, one of, the, one of my Army mates, a uh, tenor saxophone player named Jimmy Grant, mm -hmm. we had kind of stayed in touch. He called me, knew I was there. He was in Atlantic City. Okay. And he said, hey, I got a gig in Atlantic City. He said, uh, I need you on base. Okay. So we were taking the gig to work in um, the legendary, here we go with legendary again, the legendary Club Harlem in okay. Atlantic City. Okay. And this was a club where uh, it was like a cotton club type scene mm -hmm. where they had a lot, coarse line of girls and they did a show and this was a summer type thing where they had the season in Atlantic City was the summer. Okay. And he had the job working the lounge, the bar okay. in club, at Club Harlem. So I took the gig and went down there to work with him that summer. Well, he and I were playing on the bar and Coleridge Davis was the band leader for the show okay. at the club. And okay. he had the big band in the back. Okay. Now he was a piano player, is that correct? Uh, Coleridge played piano, okay. yes. Uh, yes. And Coleridge heard us, and he's, and we were a quartet, uh, tenor sax, piano, bass, and drums. Uh -huh. And uh, Coleridge approached both Jimmy and I. He said, hey, he said, you guys are here for only a couple of weeks. He said, but he said the way you guys play, he said, I want to hire you in the band. He said, I want <laughs> you here in my band. So 
we joined Coldridge's band and we played the whole summer okay. uh, at Club Harlem. Uh, when the season was over at Club Harlem that year, uh, they took the show intact, mm -hmm. chorus girls and all, they took the show intact to the Apollo in New York. Ah, okay. And okay. we uh, went to the Apollo in New York where we worked, um, I think we worked a week, uh, mm -hmm. a week or back then, I, I can't remember everything. And when we finished Club Harlem, uh, somebody, oh, the uh, producer of that particular show was a producer named Ziggy Johnson. Ziggy was known then for putting shows together. He choreographed the shows. And he was from Chicago. Okay. And so when we finished the Apollo engagement, there was a club in Chicago. There was a club in Chicago that, a club called the Rum Boogie. Okay. You have to really go back and look this yeah, up. I'm yeah. going back now in the 40s, y'all. So yeah. Y'all bear with these 40s here. The Rum Boogie <laughs> wanted to book the show intact as it was, so they took the entire show, band and all, to the Rum Boogie in Chicago. Well, now I'm back home now. Yeah. You know, and uh, with yeah. my wife, and at that time, it was only one son, because we're still talking uh, 46. Yeah. And Yvonne wasn't born until 47, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think she's born 47. Okay. But, okay, so once I'm back home, I think... Uh, after the engagement at the Rum Boogie, I think they were taking the whole show somewhere in Cleveland. But at this point, I wasn't ready to to continue all this running mm -hmm. on the road, and I wanted to at least be with my family here. I've got a, a wife and a son, and I've been away. So I didn't leave Chicago after that. Okay. I said, I, I'm going to take my chances here in Chicago. Okay. And... Uh, Okay. So that's okay. how all of that started. So. Okay. Okay. So I know then because you be you will jump ahead, but we'll come back that you okay. you stayed in Chicago. I you stayed became, in Chicago. What I've read is later, you know, you became. They were calling you Chicago soul producer and everything. Yeah, but before well, I, we jump to those yeah. things, I was going to say that you, um, I guess you played with some other jazz groups. I wanted to mention some jazz violinists, Stuff Smith. Oh yeah. And yeah. Eddie South. Right. I know you played with them. Um, you collaborated some with saxophonist Eddie Johnson. Oh, yeah. Right? And um, Dorothy Donegan's trio. Dorothy Donegan's trio. Right. <laughs> Is that correct? That was, yeah. the, I guess, Dorothy a short Donegan. stint. It's, it, I, what, I, what I read was 53, 1953 to 54. Okay. You around that time. Okay, you jumped ahead. You skipped a few years. But I that's know, all right. I did. Well, I that's did. okay. Well, because right. I know we have, we have so much to get to. <laughs> and then I wanted to even mention one of my favorites as well. A my Jamal trio. Oh, did you play Jamal, play yeah. with, I his with Jamal? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, there were a few years. I'll uh, try to quickly fill you in, fill the gap in. Okay, okay. I know that was a lot. Now we're just getting out of getting away from forty six. Yes. Uh, forty six and forty seven. Okay. Know. All right, and you've jumped ahead to fifty three. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I'll kind of fill in the gap. Okay. When I decided to stay in Chicago, um, uh, I began to you know get around and meet musicians and uh, also let other people, you know, know that, I, you know, that I was around and I could play. I think one of the first jobs I, I had was with Red Allen and J.C. Higginbotham. Okay. These okay. names may not mean anything to anybody. Red, okay. Red Allen was a New Orleans trumpet player, and uh, he didn't play the typical New Orleans music, but he um, he was more swinging. I can put it that way. J.C. Higginbotham was a trombonist, and uh, the rest of the front line was an alto player named Don Stovall. Okay. And they had a group uh, of um, trumpet. Red, Red was on trumpet, J.C. on trombone, mm -hmm. Don Stovall on saxophone, and then we had bass, drums, piano. Okay. All right, I ended up, that, that was one of my first jobs, playing with them, and of course, they weren't playing quite the music that I wanted to play because at that time, bebop was beginning to really 
sneak in there. Bebop came in in the 40s, right, the right. mid 40s, and uh, I was a I was a total disciple of uh, Dizzy, Dizzy Gillespie. Yeah. To this day, my oldest son, who happens to be standing here, yeah. His nickname is Diz. The family still to this point refer to him as Diz. <laughs> That's the family thing. He's, yeah. But he's John Jr. But that was the kind of music that I was after. I was after the bebop. I was in the Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker area. Mm -hmm. This was the kind of music that I was after. And okay. here's Red Allen and J.C. Higginbotham playing a little better than uh, Dixieland. Yeah. A little bit more than Dixieland. Wasn't quite that. But they were swinging. So that's one of the first jobs I ended up with. From there, I think I went to the Stuff Smith Trio. Okay. And uh, Stuff was the jazz violinist back then. Stuff was really hot. You know, if you look him up, listen to some of his stuff, he was really the jazz violinist. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, to recollect everything, you mentioned Dorothy Donegan. Right. Uh, well, playing around Chicago, uh, Dorothy came in, and uh, I, uh, I can't remember offhand how I'd left Snuff or anything, but anyway, mm -hmm. I did end up playing with Dorothy Donegan. Okay, and I thought that was good to mention because, like, sometimes the females got, you know, left out. I know that there yeah. were a lot of well, great Dorothy, ones that played. Dorothy, Dorothy was, was one of the real swinging women piano players. Yeah. Dorothy played, a lot of times she played standing up. Wow. Yeah, okay. She, but uh, she was a cooker. She yeah. could play. Yeah. Dorothy could play. Yeah. And uh, like you say from there, you mentioned uh, Eddie South. Mm -hmm. Eddie South was the other jazz violinist back in those days. Mm -hmm. They called him the dark angel of the violin. The difference in Eddie South and Stuff Smith, Eddie South was trained. He was a trained fiddle player. He played all the classics, mm -hmm. did a lot of... Uh, Gypsy music, okay, and uh, and of course there was that little rivalry between the mm -hmm. the two of them, you know. Uh, but uh, it was, you know, very interesting and very educational playing with the two of them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I want to go go ahead, and you can fill in the gaps because you later then started, I know you began your own groups, and you became the um, house band at the Chicago Blue Note, yeah. which led to playing with Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Bond, a lot of those people. Yeah. Um, so I, I want for sure for you, one, you can kind of tell us a little bit about how that came about. Like, I was curious about how you, when you decided um, to start your own band and, you know, doing your own music. And then I want you to tell a story about how, you know, you got to play with Duke Ellington as well. Oh, uh, that, uh, I have to back up a little bit on that. Uh -huh. um, as you recall, I mentioned when I got out of service, I went straight to New York. Yes. Well, uh, one of my idols at that time was a bass player named Oscar Pettiford. Yeah. The name might not mean too much to a lot of people now, I but know. Oscar Pettiford was a tremendous musician and a tremendous bass player. And he was one of my idols at that time. And he was working with the Duke Ellington Band. When I, um, that uh, spring when I went to New York, there's a theater on Broadway, the Paramount Theater. I don't know if it's still there or not. I'm not even sure. Don would probably do. But the Paramount Theater was doing a thing where they would feature big bands. A feature Duke, Stan Kenton, Woody Herman, Basie, uh, all of the big bands during that day played the Paramount Theater. That was the big thing, the Paramount Theater, New York on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Well, knowing this and being in New York now, I'm going to really get into music. It so happened that Duke Ellington happened to be playing the Paramount at the time that I had uh, gone to live with my aunt and uncle. So every day, I was down there standing by the stage door about the time the band came in and just hanging around. And of course, one day Oscar Pettiford came up and I just walked up to him and I said, excuse me, Mr. Pettiford. I said, my name is Johnny Pate. I said, I, I'm a bass player. And I said, I just wanted to meet you and say hi. And 
tell you how much I appreciate your playing. So I did that one day. So then he kept seeing me hang around there, and he'd, he'd, go, so he'd speak and say, hey, Johnny, how you doing? You know. So I was down there every day. <laughs> so finally one day he said, you know, come on, why don't you come on in with me? So he took me on in, and he said, play something for me. So I, you know, I played a little bass for him. He said, okay. And so then, uh, you know, he knew I was uh, kind of hanging around, and, and and we got to be we got to be good, good friends. In fact, uh, I remember once while we were doing that, he had a little boy. Uh, he had a little boy at the time, and the little boy had a nasty cold. I don't know what was happening where his wife was or something, but I kind of hung around and babysit. He uh, happened to have to have his son there, and while he was playing, I kind of babysat his son back in the dressing room. <laughs> okay. And in the meantime. Uh, some of the Ellington guys, Ellington himself, they'd see me uh, hanging around Pettiford, you know, and a lot. And, uh, you know, and they they kind of nod, speak. And this was like in 46. So all of this um, uh, will pay off later on because uh, back to the Chicago days, uh, eventually, uh, and, and I don't say this modestly, back in the early 50s, uh, I became one of the premier bass players around Chicago. In other words, when you talk about bass players, they say, hey, uh, Johnny yeah, Pate. Yeah. So therefore, I'd get calls from, uh, you know, uh, people on different gigs and things. Uh, I'll try to answer all of your questions. Uh, I know I asked uh, more the than way, one. <laughs> the, way, the, way the, um, the way I got to my own trio was um, there was a small club that happened to uh, come up in Chicago, small club called the Streamliner. Okay. And it was a very tiny place and didn't book any name entertainers in, but they booked local entertainers. They had a piano player, a guy played and sang, did a single, as mm -hmm. we called it then. Okay. A fellow named Ernie Harper. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, like we say, suave and a boner. <laughs> real cool and he did his own thing mm -hmm. so he worked the club and then they had a singer in Chicago a local singer named Lurlene Hunter might be a name you might look up you might find okay. some information about her but these were local people local Chicago people uh, get, get outside of Chicago nobody knows them it's a piano player named Claude Jones that mm -hmm. I had met when I first got out of service and uh Claude and I got to be friends, a good piano player. He and I were a duo. It was actually his gig, and he he called me one time. He said, I need a bass player. He said, and he said I like the way you play. We kind of think alike. So the club had four entertainers. They had Ernie Harper. They had Lurleen Hunter, who's a singer. And they had Claude Jones and Johnny Pate. And that's the way they build us. They build okay. us that way. Okay. The club was so small, they had, the bandstand was sm small like this. It wasn't a real bandstand. Yeah. They had two spinet pianos back to back on the stage. Ernie Harper played one. He would do his act, playing and singing. And at the end of his act, usually it was a designated song. He would play a song that, uh, whatever it was, Claude and I would go up and join him. Mm -hmm. So there'd be the two pianos, Ernie would be singing, I would play bass, and as soon as that was over, he would leave the stand, Claude and I are in place now. We would do our little act. We'd do so many numbers, then we would bring Lurleen Hunter up, and we would play behind her. Okay. She would sing, and then her closing number would be a number where Ernie Harper would come up and join us, and he would sing, duet with her, and play. Mm -hmm. So the four of us would be on stand. As soon as that number was over, Claude, I, and Lurleen would leave the stage, and Ernie would be in place. So that's mm -hmm. the way the club operated. Okay. The other thing about the club that was unique was it was a listening club. It was a very small club, and people would come in to listen. And if people were in talking or loud or anything, other people... Uh, clients, patrons at the club would turn around and say, shh, shh, we're trying to listen. Well, we can't hear. Now, <laughs> if the talking continued, 
the management would come over and ask people, would you kind of lower your voices because these people are trying to listen. And you know, you have obnoxious people out here and some would just keep on. So next time the club, the management would come over, they'd bring you a check and say, we'd like for you to leave. And other entertainers would come in. It got to be a club where other entertainers knew about it. Uh, say maybe big name entertainers. I remember mm -hmm. Sarah Vaughn came in one night and yeah. she and Lurleen were friends. She got up without even asking, come up and sang with Lurleen, you know. Mm -hmm. George, George Shearing came in ah. one night, asked to play. Yeah. You know? And it was this type of club in the Streamliner back in, I'm talking uh, early 50s, got to be a pretty well known club. Now, um, like, Everything, you know, nothing is forever. So they never had had drums in the club because actually there was really no space for it on this small uh -huh. bandstand. Mm -hmm. They had never had big name entertainers in the club. Well, the piano player that I was working with, Claude Jones, he decided he was gonna leave uh, for whatever reason. And they were stuck without uh, piano players, so they called me and said, well, can you get another piano player? Who do you, uh, can you find somebody? So mm -hmm. uh, I looked around and I, uh, and I wasn't able to really come up with anybody, but at the time, um, the club was being booked by Associated Booking, which was run by a guy named Joe Glazer. You might look that up on the internet sometime. Joe mm -hmm. Glazer, they, say was uh, a mafia affiliated, but he had this booking agency, Associated Booking. He was booking a club and he called me one day and said, look, he said, I got a piano player. He said, he's not really a jazz piano player, but he can play, you know, a certain amount of jazz. And mm -hmm. I had met this guy briefly because when I was working with Eddie South, we were working at Washington, D.C. And uh, Eddie had this guy come up and play with us one time. He was a classical type piano okay. player. Okay. His name was Don Shirley. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people uh, don't yeah, even know no, who Don no, Shirley was. Well, Don, virtuoso, yeah. classical pianist, very talented though, you know, Mm -hmm. he, he could, he had big ears, he could hear things. So um, Don, uh, you know, so the agency says, well, do you think you can do anything with Don Shirley? Well, the guy that ran the agency in Chicago knew that I had, you know, a little mm -hmm. knowledge of piano. He said, well, maybe you can help him, you right, know, right. learn uh, yeah, with a little jazz. jazz. So, so Don and I got together and we uh, put together kind of a concept where we would take pop tunes and give them a little classical treatment. In the okay. meantime, Don was trying to get his jazz chops together. And uh, so we worked together for a okay. while. And okay. uh, uh, it got to be to a place where we began to get uh, pretty popular. And we got an offer to go into a club in New York on the east side, a club called the Embers back then the east side of New York. You work the east side of New York, you, you really, you're really in, because that's just where the upper mm -hmm. crust was. Mm -hmm. Well, by that time, I had a third child, and I wasn't ready to, to leave Chicago again. I was ready to stay in Chicago. So I told Don, so when the gig came up, I said, Don, I said, well, I said, I'm not going. Yeah. Oh, well, he, he was all upset. Well, what am I gonna do, you know? And uh, you had mentioned Ahmed Jamal earlier. Well, Chicago at that time, the bass players in Chicago, we were a very close group, very close-knit group. There was no competitiveness going on. We were just tight. Hey, if I can't make this gig, hey, here's a gig for you, you know. Mm -hmm. So one of the bass players there was a bass player named Richard Davis. Mm -hmm. Richard Davis was classically trained. He had done symphony work and he was now working with Ahmed Jamal. Okay. And so I said, Richard, this is a, the gig for you, a perfect opportunity. I said, look, at the gig in New York is for a couple of weeks. 
I said, I don't want to go. Mm-hmm. He said, well, he said, hey, he said, I'm working with Ahmed, Ahmed Jamal. He said, I, he said, I, I, I don't want to leave my gig. And he had been hearing some stories about Don Shirley, which I won't even go into those, but he said, uh, he said, I don't know about going with this guy. I said, look, Richard, I, t- I said, I'll tell you what I said. I think this would be a great opportunity for you. I said, you're a single guy. I said, he said, but he said, shoot, he said, suppose it doesn't work out. I said, well, I said, let's go talk to Ahmed. I said, if Ahmed will have me, I'll hold your gig with Ahmed, and you go on and do this two weeks in New York. So we went and talked to Ahmed, and Ahmed said, sure. He said, no problem. So that's how I got to work with Ahmed Jamal. Right. Richard Davis took, went to New York with Don Shirley. Richard Davis never came back. <laughs> never came back. <laughs> Richard took New York by storm. Yeah, he went to work. Uh, one of the, one of the biggest gigs was with uh, Sad Jones, Mel Lewis, big big band orchestra, and, and uh, uh, he ended up recording Barbara Streisand. Everybody wanted Richard Davis. Mm-hmm. He was that good, you know. Yeah. But that's how I got. Okay. With Ahmed. Now, okay. Okay. go on back. Now, the Streamliner. In the meantime, uh, they had begun to change policy. They had, like everything changes, they'd begun to say, well, we want to start booking in names. Mm -hmm. So they began booking in name trios. And when they started bringing in drums, a lot of the patrons, you know, it had been a very quiet club now. Uh, Billy Taylor trio was Mm -hmm. booked in there. I'm trying to think of some of the other trios that worked there, but uh, they began booking in name trios. And some of the clientele, the patrons began to fall off. Well, then they wanted to revert and go back to the old original idea. Well, Ernie Harper had moved on, and uh, so when they got ready to go back, they called me and they said, well, hey, you know, we want you to come back because, you know, some of our old regulars, they know your name and they know you were here, and uh, they had gotten a a girl vocalist, and uh, they they uh, I think something happened where she couldn't come in for the first week, and uh, I had found a piano player. Uh, found a piano player named Ron L. Bright. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had called me, uh, I guess, while I was working there with Don Shirley. He called me one day and he said, uh, uh, my name's Ron L. Bright. He said, I play piano. He said, I happen to be in the streamliner. And man, he said, I sure like the way you play, and, you know, and, and he said, I'd love to play for you sometime. And yeah. I'm the kind of person where, you want to play for him? What are you doing this afternoon? Come over and play. <laughs> so he came over that day and yeah. he said, I don't play. I said, man, I said, you play good, you know. Yeah. So when um, yeah, so Streamliner kind of tried to together. get this thing back together, uh, I called Ron L. I said, hey, I said, yeah. well, he was tickled to death. Now, because the singer couldn't make it for the first couple of weeks or something, the streamliner upon their own, they took it upon themselves. They hired a drummer. Wow. I didn't even know, know uh, who they were hiring. Hmm. Uh, and the guy they hired was a nice guy, a nice enough drummer. Wasn't a great drummer, but one of the nicest guys in the world. So they were okay with drums now? They were okay with drums. Okay. They wanted, uh, because of the singer they had coming in, yeah. uh, uh, wanted wanted right. drums with right. with her act. Okay. okay. So, uh, and then they wanted me, so they said, well, for the first week, we're going to just call it the Johnny Pate Trio. Okay. So the club gave me a trio because wow. as a okay. bass player, okay. I would have never, I would have yeah. never gotten the trio together. Wow. Not as a bass player, you know, yeah. piano, bass, drums, come on, you, yeah. know, you know. So that's how I got a trio. Okay. And okay. what happened was when we finally got started, uh, the London House, which mm-hmm. is also a legendary right. place in right. Chicago, the London House uh, was mainly a, a high-class restaurant, and they had decided that they want to put music in. Uh, the owners were two brothers, the Marienthal brothers, and Oscar Marienthal, one of the brothers. He was always in the streamliner because mm-hmm. he liked music. He was always mm-hmm. in there, you know, and. Uh, he come in and so, you know, I got to know him. And so he said to me one day, well, one night he was in the club. He said, you know, we're thinking on going music in the club. He said, uh, I said, we're thinking on maybe trying to go in 
big names. He said, okay. but he said I'd like to bring your trio in as the off night okay. group. You know, okay. you guys work off nights. And, yeah. And uh, of course, this is taking a step up. So yeah. I said, oh yeah. Yeah. So Johnny Pay Trio now is going to the yeah. London House, okay. working on. The house. Okay. In the meantime, uh, the Blue Note, the owner of the Blue Note, Frank Holzfein, uh the Blue Note was a uh, hot jazz spot. It happened that um, I can't remember whether it was Ella Fitzgerald or Sarah Vaughan that came mm -hmm. in first. Mm -hmm. But at that time, they carried piano players, and they would hire bass players and drummers wherever right. they went. Right. So uh, Sarah or Ella were coming in, and they had their piano player. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Jones was with Sarah, and I remember Hank Jones was with yeah. Ella. Yeah. And so uh, I got the call. Actually, uh, the drummer in my trio and I yeah. both got the call. And since they worked a full week and we were working off nights right. at the Blue Note, I'd work uh, the Monday and Tuesday at the, at the uh, London House, and the rest of the week, you know, when an artist would come in, I'd be working at the Blue Note. Yeah. So I had pretty much a full week going. Right, and right. So that's how uh, they began yeah, to say we were started. the okay. we were the house, house trio at, the, okay. at the, yeah, Blue Note. Wow. And uh, okay. that plus some other things. And then the Associated Booking Agency, they were booking everybody. They had Duke. They had Dave Brubeck. Mm -hmm. They had um, Ellington. Yes. They had all of the big names. Yeah. And so this one uh, time the Ellington thing came about because Ellington's bass player, uh, Ellington's bass player at the time, his father died. It's a guy named Aaron Bell, I never forget. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Aaron's father passed away. And the Ellington band were playing St. Louis. Yeah. Well, I got a call like on a Thursday from the booking agency, the guy that ran the agency, Freddie Williamson. Okay. He's a big Texan, you know, yeah. and, he, and he really liked me. Okay. Called me, said, Johnny, he said, need, need a big favor. Duke needs you in New York wow. tomorrow night. Needs you in St. Louis <laughs> yeah. tomorrow night. Yeah. Got on the plane with my bass, flew to St. Louis, no rehearsal. Practically right. walked on the bandstand. And you said no music, right? No music, practically <laughs> no music. The bass book was practically non-existent. Yeah. But because of my association with Pettiford in the past, I kind of knew the book. I had heard the show so many times, and Ellington's show didn't change that much. Yeah. And practically walked on the bandstand, and Duke said, oh, you're the one who used to hang around with Pettiford. Yeah. You, know, you remembered me. And... Uh, from incredible. that time on, any time Ellington needed a replacement or something, I got the call. Yeah. And uh, there was one uh, trip where they worked. They were working the Blue Note, and the bass player at that time was a guy named Jimmy Woody. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy got sick, had practically had pneumonia the whole time they were there. So I worked practically the entire engagement. Yeah. And little to my knowledge. Somebody did a bootleg recording, which eventually ended up on Roulette Records. Yeah. And uh, I didn't even know the recording existed. Right. Of course, I never got paid anyway. But <laughs> this bootleg recording, uh, a friend of mine that had been in the Army with me, a guy that knew of me in the Army and who had kind of kept up with me, called me and he said, I'm holding in my hand a double Duke Ellington CD on roulette, and guess who's playing bass on some of these tracks? <laughs> I said, well, I said, not me. I said, because I'd never recorded with Duke. I didn't know right, how, right. I didn't know the right. I didn't know the recording. But it's out play. there. It's, it's out, out there, there. And, and sure enough, on the, on the record is my name. And I said, well, I, you know, first I said, well, I said, he had to make a mistake. But then this guy that to call me, told me about it. He said, well, if they made a mistake, Ellington's making a mistake because he says, after Satin Dial, he said, Johnny Pate on bass. <laughs> you know. So I said, well, I can't deny that. Right. I can't so deny it's that. It's definitely then, you. Then, uh, of 
course, when I got the record, that's the two it. I said, well, I guess. Yeah. I think that is me. I think I remember playing. Right, right. <laughs> you know? That's a great story. So, that's so, a great story. So much for that. Yeah. Now, I want to get into the um, the arranging, because I know during all this time, you were always writing. I was always even writing. thinking, even for today, that um, there was a lot of stuff. We had trouble picking what we were going to play, because you had written some new stuff. You would even grace my name on some of the stuff. I'm going to keep that forever. I'm going to be playing that for sure, you best believe. But I had even written, I, I felt like, I think people that love to write, you kind of do it all yeah. the time. And even just in thinking about um, getting with you, I even wrote a song, which we did decide yeah. to include that but with, with you in mind. But I, what I was going to say was, um, I know you went on to start recording quite a bit of um, material with um, your own groups. Swing and Shepherd Blues was one of your big hits. Yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of funny. Uh, funny, we were sitting at breakfast this morning. My kids, my kids and I were um, sitting there, like I say, uh, it's not often that I get them all together because, yeah. like I said, they live all over the place, you know. They live all over the place. My daughter's in Portland. Uh, Diz is outside of Chicago and Donald's in New York. Yeah. So uh, when uh, when Diz uh, decided he was coming down for a visit, he called Yvonne. And so Yvonne said, okay. And Donald was just coming back from Denmark. He, he was in Denmark, I guess, this time last week. Yeah. But... They all emerged and came in. So we were sitting at the uh, dinner table this morning, and we were uh, kind of reminiscing over things. And um, they were kind of saying, uh, everybody used to say, everybody used to think we were rich. <laughs> and, and, and they were kidding. And so um, Diz or one of them said, they didn't know my daddy worked two and three jobs when we were little, you know, yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. to, to, to everything. And so part of that was one of the day jobs that I worked in, because I work day jobs and night jobs, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. Hey, I, I had three kids to support. Yeah. So I was working in a music store. Okay. And it was called Gamble Hinge Music, mm -hmm. and they had uh, it was they sold all kind of stuff. They sold instruments on. They had an instrument counter where they sold instruments. They stole sheet music, and they had a small record mm -hmm. uh, department. Yeah. And I managed the record department. Okay. Managed it. I was the only clerk there, you know. Yeah. So I sold the records and I, you know, and the record came in this one day, and the record uh, was by a guy named Mo Kaufman. And I never will forget it. was called Red and Hot, Red Hot and Cool Jazz or something like that. Okay. And Mo Kaufman was a saxophone flute player. He was a flute player. And on this particular album, was a tune that Moe had written called Swing and Shepherd Blues. Yeah. Well, back in those days, in the 50s, uh, it was a general practice in the recording business that you cover a record. You could cover something. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was, you know, it wasn't no big thing. I heard this, and I said, whoa, I said, that's a, I said, that's a swinging thing. Well, King Records, that's the record that James Brown was on, Bill Doggett, Mm -hmm. They were out of Cincinnati. Uh, they had called me, I guess, a few months before that, and there was a jazz record out called Opus de Funk. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was flute, vibes, guitar, and it was a really a big jazz seller. So they had wanted to do a jazz record to kind of cover this Opus de Funk record because... Uh, it was selling pretty good, so there was a guy who represented them in Chicago, and he came to me and said, hey, he said, can you kind of duplicate this thing? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. So I had gotten together a flute player, vibe player, and a guitar player, yeah. and the uh, funny thing is that I'll throw this, throw this in. The vibe player that I got together was one of the guys who was really responsible for Earth, Wind, Fire, mm -hmm. a guy named Charles Stepney. Yeah. If you look at some of the early Earth, Wind, Fire, you'll see okay. Charles Stepney on there. Okay. Well, Charles and I had met, and uh, he was a keyboard player, but he also messed around with vibes. So I had Charles on vibes on this thing, and we had done this cover record on um, uh, Opus de Funk. So mm -hmm. it was, but it was with flute. Flute was, you know, pretty much on top. So. The same guy from Congress came up and said, you know, uh, oh, oh, no, I called him. 
I said, you know what? I said, there's a flute album that just came in. I said, it's got this catchy tune on it called Swingin' Shepherd Blues. I said, this thing could be a hit as a single. He said, well, let me call Cincinnati. He called Cincinnati and he told him, he said, well, Johnny Fate's got this idea and, you know, so they called back and said, well, how soon can he do it? Mm -hmm. I said, I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, almost. Yeah. So I threw this thing together real quick and we put out the single. Mm -hmm. And we almost carbon copied what Mo Kaufman had done. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we came out with ours before him. And of course, his record company, since they had the original, they said, well, we got to come out. But ours had beat his out. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so it kind of took off. Hit. Ours became a hit. Yeah. You know. Ours yeah. became a hit, yeah. and uh, so that was how I, I guess I got into the quintet business. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the only thing is, everybody had me playing flute, and I specifically had them put on the album who the flute player was. So, right. You know, the lead instrument young, was really yeah. The lead yeah, instrument flute. was flute, and yeah. I was playing bass. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But that's how the swinging shepherd. Okay, thing. okay, okay. Because yeah, I was curious about how you had decided. My my thought, even in doing my own records, of if you're gonna do something that you know, uh, you didn't write. You yeah. know, there's always a thought process in how you decide. But that's a good story about yeah. how you decided. Now. Just for a time, I want to get into, because um, we've spent a lot of time on, on your jazz side, but even more amazing, that you were one of the few that was also able to make a transition, and you did quite a bit of R&B um, work, arranging, composing, and producing. So I'll, I'll just throw out some of the names, and then I'll ask you the question. But I wanted to say, what I we've talked a little off camera, so I know a little bit about this, but I know that um, you... Uh, had a big hit with Major Lance, and um, correct me if I'm wrong. Was he was he with ABC Paramount? No, okay. uh, Major Lance was with uh, OK. Records. OK, that's right. That's OK right. Records, that's which right. was a subsidiary of Columbia Records. Right. OK. Back okay. in those days, uh, the major labels uh, were getting to the place of where they wanted to get into the R and B and the soul. Yeah. Records. So. Generally, what they would do, they would hire uh, hire a producer to go out and search out soul records, and and they right. were competing with trying to compete with the Motown, Chess, okay. and all these people. Yeah. And so uh, that's uh, Major Lance in, okay. ended up on OK. OK. But I know the song that became a hit, um, Curtis Mayfield wrote it. Right. So then I know that then the transition, because you later end up. Um, being a, a great arranger, composer, producer for the Impressions, and then you did um, Curtis Mayfield, a lot of work for Curtis Mayfield, including Superfly and some of the big name hits that you know yeah. we all know know and love. And that was with ABC Paramount. That you was became with ABC an a &R, even an A and R director for them as well. Yeah, right? uh, see, Curtis uh, became associate producer for. Uh, OK Records, okay. and that was through a producer named Carl Davis. Carl Davis was put in charge of OK by Columbia. OK, OK. And uh, so he, Carl was pretty smart, so he uh, brought Curtis in as his associate producer mm -hmm. because of Curtis' composing ability. Yeah. And that's how the Major Lance thing came about. OK, OK. So this was the first time I had worked with Curtis over anything. and Right. Curtis really liked the way that I wrote, you know, yeah, the arranging, yeah. you know, because I had little jazz influence there. Okay. And uh, so after the Major Lance things began to take off, Curtis, um, you know, said to me, he said, well, you know, we were at ABC Paramount. And he said, you know, my group's the Impressions. He said, we got a date coming up. He said, uh, we want you to do some stuff with us, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said, okay, because... At this point, this is when I began to get into arranging. And uh, when I started getting into arranging, that's when I kind of stopped playing, you know. Yes. Because I said, hey, for one thing, uh, I've always been pretty lazy most of my life. So I said, well, carrying a briefcase and a pen around is a little easier than carrying a bass fiddle around. <laughs> yes. so, yeah. So, so I said, so. And then it I said, some royalties, too, when you start writing. And, start and writing, and, you know. Uh, that's the other thing, you know. And, uh, so uh, 
I started doing uh, things with Curtis, and I think one of the first dates I did with them was a thing called It's All Right, which yeah. got to be a huge hit. You yeah, know? yeah. And uh, then ABC Paramount began to notice the other things that we were doing together. We did Amen and right. some other things, Keep On Pushing. People Get Ready. People Get Ready. Yeah. You know? And uh, <laughs> so ABC Paramount, uh, at that time, they, they, they called me in. They said, hey, wait a minute. He said, we had never been selling impression records like this before, so we know you're doing something else, so we want to hire you. Yeah. So they hired me as Midwest uh, A&R director, and at that time I'd go out and find groups and bring groups in and uh, began to work with them. And, of course... Um, so B.B. King was one that yeah, you worked B. B. with? King, uh, yeah, B.B. King. ABC had signed B.B. King at the time, and when they signed B.B. King... Uh, I guess having a black in-house producer, you know, they didn't quite know what to do with him. And uh, so uh, they assigned B.B. King to me. And of course, uh, we were fortunate enough to do B.B. King live at the Regal, yes. which B.B. Um, uh, says to me, I think every time I see him now, he still says, you know, he says people all over the world are still talking about B.B. King live at the Regal. <laughs> and, uh, Someone said, I, I don't know how true it is, but someone said that that particular blues recording, uh, live blues recording, is now in the uh, Smithsonian. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I read that it was one of the um, yeah, best yeah, uh, blues uh, live recordings. Yeah, they said that uh, Rolling Stone has it listed as one of the best live blues recordings. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think the nearest the Grammy people uh, have it also listed as one of their... Uh, top things, but uh, yeah. that's how I, 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 I guess I began to really get, in, get into the yeah. arranging. Then yeah. I began to get calls from everywhere. Yeah, people Bryson. Arrange. I mean, it was yeah, just well, all that over. Was, that was even the much BGs, later. I yeah, mean, the Bee Gees. I got to, I was selling orange and got a call one day from the Bee Gees. This English voice got on the phone to uh, uh, Johnny Payton. <laughs> <laughs> And so we, so the guy said, "I bought the Bee Gees, you know." So they, so um, they flew me out to the West Coast, and of course, there's a little heard of album that they did called "Life in a Tin Can." Mm. Uh, uh, I have a vinyl copy of it. Yeah, you might run it out somewhere, but uh, it's the thing that I did with the Bee Gees. Yeah, so yeah. I began to get calls from a lot of people in. You got into movie, movie, yeah. um, movie. Uh, well, I, the movie thing kind of came came around. Uh, that was that was later on, of course. Uh, right, right. I read. Can I read off some of the movies? I had Shaft in Africa, um, Brother on the Run, Bucktown, USA, Doctor Black and Mister Hyde, Satan's Triangle, um, the original score for Bustin' Loose. Yeah. 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 Um, and then you did the Shaft TV show as well. Yeah, it was the Shaft TV show. After yeah. um, uh, the last Shaft feature that they did, of course, the first Shaft thing was Isaac Hayes. Yeah. Then they did Shaft's big score. Yeah. Uh, I think Gordon Parks did the score and the music for that. A mm -hmm. lot of people didn't know Gordon Parks was a musician as well as a photographer. Yeah. But uh, Gordon Parks did that. And when they got ready to do um, the last Shaft feature, Shaft in Africa, at that time, I was working for Verve Records, uh, which was a division of MGM. Verve Records it was a division of MGM, and the guy that was the liaison between the movie company and the record companies, uh, he really liked uh, my work, and he called me one day, he said, you know, they're getting ready to do another Shaft feature. And he said, uh, he said, you mind if I throw you day in, I said, hey, I said, I'd be honored. So he really went to bat on it because he called me and said, man, he said, they want to meet with you. I was just, so I flew out to California and the producers, the producer and the director, uh, they had listened to some of the stuff that this guy had taken to them and mm -hmm. he said, hey, we want you to do the score. Yeah. And uh, that particular score, uh, I will cherish forever. Yeah. That goes into some other stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, it uh, it was really a big thing. And yeah. uh, now, now tell me how because I know even you did some work with Joe Williams. You worked a lot with the big orchestras, putting these things together. 
these things together, like for movies, for TV. This is big stuff. A lot of musicians, a lot of people. Just tell me, because I know, one, it can be very stressful. You're working on um, deadlines, time deadlines. But tell me, because just looking at you, I mean, I'm trying to take notes. I want to, you know, be able to be doing as well as you are at your age. But I can tell that you deal with um, being under the time deadline and stress very well and being able to be good at bringing a lot of people together for a common goal. But I just want you to speak a little bit about, you know, how you went about um, you know, putting everything together and manage that stress level and everything. Uh, well, I, I guess I think um, the main thing when I decided that I wanted to be a musician for a living and got into it, and as I mentioned before, I had a family. Yeah. And um, to a certain point of view, you know, like the entertainment business and is is can be very glamorous, you know, and guys begin to get out there and they think, well, whoa, they begin to get that swagger and that thing, hey, you know, man, hey, man, I'm a musician, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, I looked at it always, I said, hey, this is the only thing I know how to do, really, because I never had any schooling on anything else, mm -hmm. and fortunately had a little talent, of course, my little standing joke that I usually tell, you know, that people will say, well, you're doing music, music business. Tell me about the music business. And I usually say, well, I didn't know how to do nothing else. And I was too nervous to steal or sell dope. So I decided this is a business. Yes. And I'm going to treat it as a business. Right. And that's the way I've always treated it. Uh, right. Horace Silver and I never will think this goes back to the 50s. And I had a chance to meet Horace Silver. He came to Chicago with Stan Getz. Mm -hmm. And uh, they played the Blue Note. And at the time, uh, yeah. I was working at the Blue Note. Right. Horace and I got to be kind of tight. And I remember one day we were after the gig. It was a late at night. Uh, and uh, we were sitting having coffee. And we talked about the business. And Horace, of course, you know, prolific writer, composer, yes, yes. and uh, from, from the beginning I tried to, you know, do my little composing on the side, just like uh, you had mentioned the composing thing, and that's the other thing that I advise any young musician to do, mm -hmm. try to compose, Yeah. try to get your stuff out there, Yeah. because on Swing and Shepherd Blues, which I didn't write, I made sure the flip side of the record I wrote, right? You know, yeah. and always try to get original stuff in. Yeah, you had original. That's number on one. Every that's movie. that's number one. You do. Yeah. Number two, get into the publishing business. That's the one thing I got to say about the hip hoppers today. Mm -hmm. These young people, they're smart. Jay Z, Diddy, right. Fifty Cent's. Right. These are smart little. Right. And they we should say that they've sampled you now. Jay-Z, P. Well, Diddy, yeah, I, I, we and the list the, goes on. Yeah. Shaft in Africa, they've yeah. sampled. Yeah, they, they definitely do that. But to get back to your original yeah, question, wanna, to get back to your question, work. you treat it as a business. Yeah. And once you start treating it as a business, then you're going to be all right. And really, you have to stick to it. And uh, like any other business, don't let failures discourage you, I think. Hey, you're gonna fail at something eventually, yeah. but yeah. stick with it, but treat it as a business. Yeah. And that's mainly what I did. Right. Tried to get the best people I could involved when I'd have to record. Right. Try to get the best musicians that I could. And uh, when you're using musicians, you treat them like they're employees. I mm -hmm. never will forget. When I'd have, if I had a morning date, if I had a morning recording date, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I got a bunch of musicians, yeah. let me tell you, I stopped at a bakery or a donut shop somewhere, and donuts were there for the guys, you know. Yeah. And this is part of business, you know, yeah. relationships, you know. And the other thing was um, musicians knew that if it was my record date, they could figure on we're going to get some overtime because I would purposely stretch the date into some overtime. Record companies, millions of dollars. What's a little overtime going to be to them? But to the musicians, that extra half hour, hour overtime, that's going to be a little more money. Yeah. So 
all of my dates, make them go over time. Mm. And this would be for the musicians, for the mm. sake of the musicians. Mm. And as far as the stress is concerned, uh, I've always, I guess, been able to handle stress. You know, uh, here I am, a young kid. I'll go back to a personal thing. I was a young, young guy wanting to be a musician, wanting to really put my efforts into music. And I looked up, but I had a little family to support. I had kids to support. Now, I looked at it and I said, whoa, it's a big job I got here. I got to feed some little mouths here. That could have stressed me out. But I say, hey, I can do this. Yeah. I can do this. And whatever the projects were that came up, I'd have a deadline. Mm -hmm. I'd say to myself, there's a deadline, but I can do this. Yeah. And as long as you continue to say to yourself, I can do this, yeah. you can get it done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I looked up, I can think of situations that were really ridiculous. Uh, in 50, 52, 53, I ended up in an automobile accident. I wasn't driving. This is when I was playing bass for a living. That's what I was doing for a living. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fractured this clavicle. Mm. This is the hand that goes up yeah, like it's this. very important. Fractured that clavicle, an automobile accident. Yeah. I can't think, of, I can't remember how many months it was before I could go back to work. Yeah. I still had th these three kids. Yeah. They had to eat. Yeah, yeah. When I got so I could go back to work, even before I could go back to playing bass, I went on and got a day job. Yeah. Worked in a department store. Yeah. In a receiving department. Yeah. Because things have to be done. Mm -hmm. But this is how you handle stress and situations. Yeah. No matter what the situation is, you can do that. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. All you gotta do is get out there and try. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well that's good. And that's basically how I would handle it. Uh, okay. Um, okay. I got a call, you mentioned uh, the question you were asking me about musicians, you know, how you deal with musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, and there have been some very stressful times uh, working with Joe Williams. Uh, actually, I was retiring. Uh, we moved to Vegas uh, when my youngest son, who's not here, mm -hmm. my youngest son, Brett, was seven. Okay. We moved to Las Vegas, and I was retiring. Yes. Joe Williams was living there. Joe I had met in Chicago many years ago. And uh, Joe had been living in Vegas. He had been living in Vegas at least 10 years when I moved there. Yeah. So I was moving there to retire, be, retire because I didn't want to bring up my last son. I, I didn't want to bring him up in L.A., and he was mm -hmm. seven at the time. Okay. We moved to Vegas, and so I was retiring. So... Um, Call Joe and say, hey, Joe, I just bought a house in Vegas, you know. And we, we, what house? We, we, he said, so I told him, I said, I'm retiring. He said, no, he said, you ain't retiring on me. <laughs> so he kept me writing arrangements every time, every now and then. Yeah. Or if he would do a local uh, gig, he did. He would never work in Las Vegas. But anytime there was a benefit or charity thing, he was there to do it. And he called me to conduct for him. Yeah. He has a freebie, you know, so, yeah. so I'd go conduct for him, you know, because he was a friend. And then whenever he did a symphony date, he would call me to uh, conduct for him because his pianist and uh, really his, his entertainment director, the pianist named Norman Simmons. I don't know if you know that name. I do. Great I piano do. player. Yeah. He Check him out on the internet. Check him out on the internet. He's bad. Yeah. But Norman would say, uh, anytime uh, being a musical director, Norman would say, well, he's got to do a symphony gig. I don't want to deal with them symphony musicians. Symphony musicians are a whole new breed. They're a whole, they're, they're a whole, there's, there's something else to deal with. <laughs> and especially, if you're a jazz musician, oh boy, they really look down their nose on you, <laughs> at you. So, um, in fact, uh, I had someone call me not too long ago, a drummer, who's a great arranger, a guy named Dennis McCrell, who had worked some gigs with Joe. He had worked some symphony gigs with Joe where I conducted the symphony. And uh, he's, a, he's uh, really uh, getting into some of that now, but he wanted to 
to take lessons from me, but, but I don't really teach, you know. But uh, he's a good friend. And I said, Dennis, I said, I don't teach. I said, but if there are any questions you ever have to, want to ask me, call me. And he asked me the question like Arlington was asking just now, how did you deal with, you know, so many different personalities out here? And uh, once again, it's one of those situations where you don't let it get to you. Say, I can do this, you know. Right, right, right. The other thing that I advise people to do, and I've always you know, done this, never be ashamed to say that you've never done something before. Yeah, that's good. I never yeah. will forget going to do the first movie that I ever did the correct way. Superfly and some of these other things, they were done not the correct way movies are done. But when you, uh, uh, I don't know how they're doing it now because I've been away from it 20, 30 years. But when you go out there to do a movie, they have certain procedures that they use. They, at the time, they were dealing with click track, were dealing with timing sheets. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never will forget the first movie. Uh, well, actually, the first real movie that I did was the Shaft in Africa thing that was done on the MGM lot in Culver City, you know, like you see in the movies, you see what movie lots are all about. This was the real thing. Go out there, I dealt with a music editor. He asked me, he said, have you ever um, uh, scored to click track? I said, no. So have you ever to, uh, he asked me a few other questions. I said, no, I've never done that. He said, but you can write. I said, oh yeah, I said, I can write. He yeah. said, tell you that, I can write. Yeah. I said, that's all I need to know. Yeah. I said, I'll walk you through it. And I suppose I'd go on and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I did that before. And I know <laughs> a lot of situations guys say, yeah, yeah, man, I can do that. Right. Yeah. Get there. You have no idea what they're doing. Man, you got to say, oh, I thought you said you could do that. But the same token, say, hey, I've never done that before. But i got intelligence enough to learn. Yeah. 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 So never be ashamed to say that you've never done something before. Yeah. That's great Go advice. Great never advice. Be That's wonderful advice. Well, our time is really getting past this. So I could talk to you all day, but I got to let you go at some point. So I asked this last question of everyone. The show is called The Way I Hear It. And for me, the music that I uh, try to write and all, my goal all the time is to create music that just speaks life to people. So whatever you need, whether it be healing, joy, faith, whatever, that you can get that from, you know, the music. So I just want to ask you, um, how do you hear it? Do you have any thoughts, the first thing that comes to mind or anything? Well, um, I got a good friend here with me, Ken. Ken and I go through what we call listening sessions. Ken will call and say, hey, you got some time next week? So, so Ken will come over and we'll sit for hours listening. I got... Uh, I guess I've got stu so much stuff there, uh, and I'm always open to hear something new. Yeah. Uh, my son Diz over there called me one day, and we were talking about it. He asked me, said, Daddy, Daddy said, you, have you ever heard Phil Kelly? I said, no. Here I am. I've been in music all my life, all these years. And he said, you got to check Phil Kelly. Phil Kelly out. So it's a thing of where there's so much music out here that you can listen to and learn. You can hear things, eh? And to me, sometimes I listen to music. Ken and I are listening to music and I'm hearing things that I think about other people and I said, what a shame that these people cannot hear exactly what I'm hearing and appreciate it the way I can appreciate it. You know, I, I, you know, it's almost a thing of where you feel, you almost feel sorry, but the way I hear it, Arlington, I don't think I can ever hear enough. Yeah. I think almost on a daily basis, I will hear something that, that really inspires me or either I can go back and hear something 30 years ago that I hear mm -hmm. that really, you know, that really turns me on, you know. Uh, I can hear 
a lot of times I can hear something, maybe something that I did, mm -hmm. maybe something that I did 40 years ago. Yeah. And a lot of times I'll sit and I'll say, hmm, that wasn't too bad, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. uh, that's like a little joke I tell about uh, Chris Rock, you know, he says about Kim uh, Kardashian, of course I won't use his terminology, he said, I wonder if Kim Kardashian ever stands in front of the mirror in the morning and say, hmm. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and I think about, and I think about uh, of course, uh, Chris Rock didn't say it like that. Yeah, but, yeah. but I think about, a lot of times about some of the stuff that, uh, you know, that I've done. And I sit back and I listen and it actually gives me cause to kind of smile a little bit. Yeah. I say, it wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't too bad, you know. But the way I hear it, I don't think I can ever get tired of hearing it. Yeah. Hearing yeah. music, you know. Yeah. Like I'm sitting here banging on these standways. Boy, well, these pianos respond and speak to you so much, you know. And, yeah. And they make I, it easy. I keep saying, as soon as I hit the lottery, I'm going to get me one. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, I, and I'm very flattered by. Um, Young people like you digging up all this old stuff about me. Uh, you mentioned uh, the sampling that uh, Jay Z and them. Uh, I can't begin to tell you uh, what kind of feeling you have when all of a sudden you look up and hear something that you wrote over 30 years ago. Right. And out of all of the music out here, thousands and thousands of bits of music out here. Somebody jumps up and picks out some of your music. They could have picked a million other things. Yeah, yeah. And then to have in a situation of Jay-Z and Diddy, yeah. Puff Daddy or whatever he calls himself now, uh, here, Jay-Z and Puff Diddy, Daddy or Diddy, picked the identical piece of music. Here, these guys are supposed to be competitors. It's good music. Why would they pick the identical piece yeah. of music, yeah. which amounted to five notes, five chords? Yeah. yeah. And then you turn around, and here comes Rick Ross, and let's see if I get this name right. Um, Is it Ghost? Ghost? Uh, Ghostface Killer. Yeah. <laughs> Ghostface Killer. Yeah. What do you yeah. Here comes Ghostface Killer and Rick Ross picked the same identical cue from over 30 years ago. Yeah. 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 You know, and, so uh, we should say, because people will know, like Jay-Z's song, Show Me What You Got. Show Me What You Got, Jay-Z. That's Shaft in Africa. So for uh, those of you that are music enthusiasts, go check it out and make the comparison. But I was floored. I was, well, it was just, well, I was so what, happy and the way, to know about it. The, the way that I discovered, uh, and I have to throw this story in real quickly, uh, being from Chicago, um, there were a couple people in Chicago that knew my background, and they felt that Chicago should really give me my props at some time, and it never happened. One of the guys kept pushing, and he finally died. He was my original drummer. He finally died, a guy named Charles Walton. After, then there was a guitar player named Henry Johnson, who's still around, who worked with Joe Williams. Henry is uh, one of my big pushes to, uh, but anyway, between Charles Walton and Henry Johnson, they had been riding the city of Chicago. Hey, you know, why don't you give Johnny Payton his props? He's done a lot of stuff here. So the year that we moved down here, we moved in uh, 2006, uh, that January or February, uh, we were in the process of selling our house in Vegas. We were living in Vegas. Henry called me and he said, they may be getting ready to do this thing this year. He said, so hold some time open in July. So I said, okay. So before we moved from Vegas, Henry called me back and he said, they're going to definitely do it in July. I said, whoa. I said, I'm honored. So they were going to bring me to Chicago and they put a band together and 
talk about my music, you know, and honor me at uh, Millennium Park is a big park they, ha they have in downtown Chicago. So the city of Chicago is doing this. So I got to thinking, I said, well, I said, who do I know in Chicago that can get me to Kanye West or Common mm -hmm. or R. Kelly? I said, because I know I got some music that these guys can really use. I know I got some stuff that they can sample. Struck out completely. Went to Chicago, did it. Nobody I knew could even get me even close to any of these guys. Mm. So I threw it out of my mind. In July, I went on to Chicago and did this thing. Came back here to Texas that fall. I'm sitting up watching TV. And here's the American Music Awards. And here <laughs> comes, here comes Jay-Z. Big production, dancing girls and everything else. And all of a sudden I hear, ba, ba, da. I feel like I should ba, go to the bar and play it. <laughs> and I said, yeah. whoa. Yeah. And I said, that is familiar music. And something, I didn't know JC, I didn't know any of his people, I didn't know anything about it. Uh, and then he had a new uh, CD coming out. He had, I guess, had retired and came back with the new CD, Kingdom Come, is the name of the CD. So I called my son, this is the son that's here, the younger son. I called Brett, I said, Brett, I said, you know anything about a new CD by Jay-Z? He said, yeah, said, there's a new CD out. I said, well, would you pick up one for me? I said, so he went and picked up Kingdom Come. And he put it on. He called me back. He said, you don't believe this. <laughs> he said, your name is all over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think that, that was there during the fall. And I think I was watching a football game, I think, following Sunday, and here comes the Budweiser commercial. And here's Jay-Z in one car, I think Al Unser Jr. in another one, and Danica Patrick in another one. The, yeah. the three of them, and Jay-Z sitting there, show me what you got. Right, the video. Yeah, 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 the video. 30, 30 years ago? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's amazing, it's, it's, it's You know, it's, uh, uh, you know, yeah. I, I can't even tell, and, and then, you know, and I, then I went through three or four years trying to find out how it happened. Why would you select that? Went through all that, uh, couldn't get to anybody. I, the bet, closest I could get was find out that there was um, a producer named Just Blaze, Justin Blaze. And uh, I could find out that he was the one that had probably done it. I, I wrote little thank you notes to both Diddy and uh, both Jay-Z, just trying to thank them. But you know how that goes. You know, you write a letter and they, they probably don't even, don't even get a chance to see it. And uh, this past December, Kanye and Jay-Z are doing this tour. Uh, uh, what do they call it, the crown? Uh, mm -hmm. I've forgotten what they call a tour, but the two of them right. are doing this tour. And they were doing the American, uh, at the uh, American, American Airlines, Airlines Center. Center. And I was sitting at home, uh, I guess, just uh, about a week or so before the thing is, and saw it hit me and say, well, hey, you know, and I've always been the kind, hey, I'll take the bull by the horns. I go, I call the, call the uh, American Airlines Center. I called I s their main office, I said, is there anybody who can tell me who's promoting the concert? Who are the promoters? And so I got this one one young lady on there, and so I told her, I said, hey, I said, is there any way I can get to the promoters? I said, uh, my name's Johnny Pate. I said, and uh, I've never met Jay-Z. I said, and I ran my story down to her. I told her exactly what had gone down. I said, I said, here's, I said, here's the situation of where, what this man did has practically changed my life, you know. Well, through her, she got to the promoter. The promoter's office called me to verify who I was. Yeah. The afternoon of the concert, uh, I got a call, and they said, this lady's going to call you. Call me. 
I went down, had a chance to meet Jay-Z. In fact, uh, when, when Jay-Z got the story, they, the lady said, he wants to meet you. And in that way, I had a chance to really thank him, yeah. but his chief engineer, the guy who travels with him, uh, uh, Little Guru, that's the mocker <laughs> he uses, Little Guru, when he found out I was in the building, he came charging down there. He said, hey, he said, you don't know what your music has done. Yeah. Then um, one of Kanye's guys, uh, Malik, Malik, uh, he came flying in because we had to wait, you know, we had to wait uh, to see Jay-Z till he had gotten there. He wasn't even there when we got there. And Malik came around down. He said, man, he said, they told me you were here. He said, I had to meet you. Yeah. But little, little Luguru, what he did was he got on the phone, he said, and he called Just Blaze. And he said, I don't know what you're doing. He said, but I want you to drop everything. And he said, Johnny Pate is sitting here. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Can't tell you, hey. Yeah. It's, That's a great story. Yeah, That's, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. You know, it's, able, it's really, able, it's, able it's, you know, it's, 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 you know, I, I, I really can't yeah. get him tell you what yeah. <laughs> what that means. You yeah. Know, to, uh, well, I want to let you know that I thank you for being here today, well, for sharing musically, for being able to really, you know, tell us the story and share, you know, really your life with us. And you have been a tremendous blessing, inspiration to me as well. And so I just can't thank you enough for being here and sharing with us today. Well, yeah. Well, the first time I heard you play, I said. I said, I think the little man knows what he's doing. <laughs> First time, I said, I said, he knows what he's doing. Oh, I said, and, and that's something that you can tell. You can tell when somebody sits down, especially at a piano. They don't have to play for two or three bars. Yeah. Hey, yeah. And you know, they got it. Yeah. Or they don't have got it. Yeah. You know? but, I, uh, I hey. appreciate that. Hey. Well, arranger, producer, composer, <laughs> Johnny Pate. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, oh, great. visit arlingtonjones.com.